What's cracking, big dogs? Good morning to everyone, except the people that said the NFL season was not going to happen. Robert beeped that F word out in the beginning. Can't be taking L's monetary wise right off the rip. 10 seconds in, I can't hold myself. You know why? Because you guys made me yell. The NFL season is happening. It kicked off last night. I have no idea what happened because I'm filming this prior to the game. So knowing my luck, something catastrophic happened last night and there actually is no more NFL season going on. But, but, but if all things go as planned for the remainder of the weekend, we have week one of NFL football. It's a beautiful thing. We've earned this. We have waited and we have suffered. We went through the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows of, of rumors and reports and fake news and this and that and the other f thing. But we are here. Week one is here. And I figured out what the content schedule is going to be. Tuesdays, you will be getting a live stream from myself on YouTube. I will go live, not behind a wall, for everybody, for the public, for everybody. Okay? We're going to be talking about the waiver wire. We're going to be talking about a quick recap of what happened over the weekend. And we're going to be talking about maybe a little football as well. Wednesday, bunk bed breakdowns. We're going to film bunk bed breakdowns on Monday night. So we are actually going to do like an in-depth recap of the previous week and then do some trade targets for both Redraft and Dynasty. That's going to be a long episode, a long featured film that will be in theaters Wednesday. We are moving Fade the Public from Friday to Thursday. If you missed yesterday's video, it was our E-Town Get Down vlog. Low-key might have been the best video we've put out on our channel thus far in the history of the YouTubes. So make sure you go check out that video if you missed it. Thursday will be Fade the Public. Friday will be this shit, this shit right here. Okay, what this is going to be... Every week I do my rankings, my weekly in-season rankings, which you can get through Patreon, patreon.com forward slash B D G E. Okay. When you sign up for Patreon, you get my in-season weekly rankings. You get access to our discord, which in the off season gets you access to join big dogs, dynasty leagues with other big dogs members. The discord channel is like 3000 members deep. You got people talking about fantasy and sit starts and all that kind of crazy shit all the time. That also gets you access to our Saturday live stream, which I will mention in a second after we talk about Friday. So go join Patreon, patreon.com forward slash BDGE. Here's what we're going to do today. We're going to go through some of my rankings. We're going to go through some guys that I am either higher or lower on versus ECR. We're not going to go through all my rankings, of course, but some of the guys that I noticeably have higher or lower ranked versus expert consensus. So from fantasy pros, all the people throw the rankings into it, and then I'm either higher or lower on some of the guys, and I want to talk to y'all about them. Obviously, I'm not going to go through the big name guys. We ain't going to waste your time here, but we want to just go through some of the matchups that I see are glaring. Maybe some guys that you're borderline thinking about flexing and you don't know what to do. Some of them should get in your lineup. Some of them should get the out of your lineup, all right? So with that said, I'm pumped that it's week one. Robert, you're going to have to edit out all of these words i'm ready to tuck my shirt in i'm ready to stop yelling and let's eat i'll tell you what i uh unpopular thing here I went to the gym yesterday for the first time since quarantine started, and I feel a whole new energy. I didn't know how bad I needed it. I didn't think I was going to go back to a gym like possibly ever. I've been working out in the headquarters, and uh, the workouts have been shitty. Shitty as shit. Shittier than shitty as shit. Really bad stuff, okay? Yesterday, I was like, I need, I, I felt like this, this cloud in my head for a long time. I felt this like energy being depleted from me slowly throughout the summer. I'm like, I'm going to see if there's any gyms open, because in New York City, things started opening back up on September 2nd. Long story short, I went to the gym and I had felt like a caged lion that picked his lock. And now I'm fucking out here. And speaking of locks, we're going to start off with Tyler Lockett, my must start wide receiver of the week. And this might seem obvious, but clearly it's not. I have him ranked as my wide receiver nine on the week. ECR has him as the wide receiver 21. So they have him as a low end wide receiver too, which makes absolutely no sense because we have Atlanta, we have Seattle. Okay, this is going to be in Atlanta. This is going to be a shootout. The over-under is 48 and a half, one of the highest over-unders of the week. Atlanta has one of the weakest secondaries 
in the NFL. It has been our weak point for as long as I can possibly remember. I'm unfortunately an Atlanta Falcons fan, okay? Dan Quinn came over because he was blessed with the secondary in Seattle when they went on that run, the Legion of Boom. Dan Quinn was made by the Legion of Boom, not the other way around. Since then, we brought him over to be a defensive-minded head coach. Since he's come over, we have had one of the weakest pass rushes as well as one of the weakest secondaries in the NFL for like four or five years going on. He should not be our coach anymore, but lo and behold, he is. We lose Desmond Trufant this offseason, our cornerback, who was our top cornerback for a few years. He fell off last year anyway, so it doesn't matter. We use our first round pick this year on AJ Terrell, and he's a rookie, right? Besides that, we have almost nothing in the secondary in terms of like a real coverage guy that can cover a guy like Tyler Lockett. Tyler Lockett in the Dirty South is an absolute problem for defensive coordinators, okay? Tweeted this out yesterday, so make sure you are following me at Nick underscore BDGE. The Hawks played the entire NFC South division last year. It did not go well. Tyler Lockett versus the NFC South. Saints, 14 targets, 11 receptions, 154 yards, and a touchdown. At the Falcons, 6 for 100. Versus the Bucks, 13 for 152 and 2. Panthers, 8 for 120 and 1. His average line versus the NFC South opponents last year. 12 targets, 9.5 receptions, 131.5 receiving yards, and a tug. 24 half PPR points. 29 full PPR points, okay? I don't know how Lockett could possibly not get into your lineup this week, but he is an absolute must-start as a wide receiver one, as a wide receiver two, in a flex play. Wherever you have him, throw him into your lineup, as well as the homie Deshaun Jackson. Plays against Washington. Now, I have him ranked all the way up at wide receiver 20. ECR has him ranked as wide receiver 35, which makes absolutely no f***ing sense because Jalen Rager is not going to be in the lineup. You know what I'm here for? You know what would get... Oh... I would, my boner would rip straight through my jeans on Sunday if we started this game off with a Deshaun Jackson 70-yard touchdown. Washington gets the ball. Terry, F1, flames down the field, 70-yard touchdown to combat that. Next play, that'd be that'd be incredible. Two back-to-back -back plays like that, two bike to bike plays like that. As I said, Rager isn't playing week one. Miles Sanders is looking like he could be on a little bit of a, a, a limited workload as well. And we look back at week one of last year, right? Same predicament. Well, anti-predicament, I guess, when you look at it this way. Philly plays Washington. There is no other receivers outside of Deshaun Jackson on the field. Nine targets, eight receptions, 154 yards, and two touchdowns before getting hurt. Jackson is not only a long ball guy, when he's on the field. He is also a volume play and Wentz trusts him to be his go-to outside wide receiver, okay? On the outside, Deshaun Jackson's either going to get Fabian Moreau or former Eagle anti-great Ronald Darby. Both of them graded out at 100th or worse as cornerbacks per PFF grades last year. They are bad. Washington secondary, bad. And you look at what they have on the front of the defense their front seven is very 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 good i don't see i think there's gonna be a pass funnel game i don't see either team having much success on the ground they will have to throw the ball if you have deshaun jackson in your lineup i don't see a way that you don't get him in there in week one which brings me to my favorite monkey knife fight play of this game it is ridiculous terry mclaurin over 70 and a half receiving yards zach ertz over five and a half receptions. You're going to get two and a half times your buy-in on this. So if you throw down 10 bucks, you're going to win 25 from it. I see no way, shape, or form that Terry does not pop over 70 and a half receiving yards in this one. They're going to throw the ball a lot, and they're going to throw the ball a lot to Terry McLaurin. Now, the Eagles did bring in Darius Slay over as their top cornerback now, but they've already been talking about how Darius Slay is not going to play the same role that he did in Detroit. He's not going to be a shadow coverage guy all the time. Either way, we saw Terry make fucking mincemeat out of a lot of really good cornerbacks last year. So I see no way that Terry McLaurin does not top 70 and a half receiving yards in this one. Zach Ertz, again, with Jalen Rager out, they're going to need someone who operates over the middle of the field. And we just remember back to how Zach Ertz finished the season last year, just catching like eight to 10 passes a game. I don't see a way in which Zach Ertz does not go over five and a half receptions. So we hit more on Terry McLaurin. We hit more on Zach Ertz. We throw down 10 bucks and we're going to win $25 from it. If you're new to Monkey Knife Fight, make sure that you sign up with the promo code BDGE. You're going to get a 100 deposit match bonus. So if you throw 10, you're actually going to get 20 to play with. So you can throw 20 down on this and win 50 bucks. They got a billion different little games you can mess around with if you like certain other players. Like you want to go over 14 and a half PPR for Zach Ertz and 10 and a half for Gibson. That's a pretty good bet as well. But they've got the entire slate of Sunday games. So you can mess around with that. Let's switch it bike over to my ugly mug. So we have Deshaun Jackson, of course. Now we have this other guy, Brian Edwards, rookie. 
playing at Carolina in week one. My rank is wide receiver 42. ECR is 59. So this is not necessarily like I need you to get Brian Edwards into your lineup. This is more so he is flex viable. I am okay throwing into my flex if we're in a deeper league here. And really what this goes to is that the fact that he's probably unowned in a lot of leagues right now, okay? He's probably sitting there on your waiver wire and he's going to be one of the top pickups after this weekend's games, okay? So I would probably try to grab him before the game start, right? This video is coming out Friday, so you got two days to do so. If you got an empty bench spot, like you drafted Divino Zigbo, now he's on the IR, grab that motherfucker. Up. He's going to be starting in outside two wide receiver sets, which means he's going to be on the field for like 85 to 90 percent of the snaps in Oakland. And he gets to play Carolina, man. Carolina, you want to talk about the Falcons secondary stinking Carolina's secondary. It makes them look like the Legion of Boom. Honestly, it makes Dan Quinn look like he's good again. Their top cover corner, James Bradbury, is gone. He's now playing for New York, which snacks is enamored by. Their number two, Eli Apple, on the IR. Their number three, Dante Jackson, graded out as PFF's 90th best cornerback last year. He was benched like multiple times last year, so that should tell you. If you're on a team, you're a cornerback on a team that allows the second most points per game in the NFL and you're getting benched on that team, you've got problems. Their next guy up is a fourth-round rookie. So, case in point, this coverage is going to be miserable. This is a game that can get up there in points and really quickly. I, I think this is an underrated shootout game. 48 points over under, which Vegas already knows there's going to be a lot of points scored. But if you look at the pieces on the field, I think there's going to be a lot of quick hitting action. You have DJ Moore, you have Curtis Samuel, you have Robbie Anderson, you have Christian McCaffrey, all guys capable of going the distance on any given play. In Oakland, you have Henry Ruggs, you have Darren Waller, and you have Brian Edwards operating as the possession guy. So I think a lot of points are going to be scored, a lot of drives down the field, a lot of first downs, a lot of plays run. Now, I'm not predicting a massive game for Brian Edwards again. I think six to seven targets and somewhere in like the four the five catch range for 70 yards is very possible. I think he just ends up being one of the top waiver wire priority pickups of the week because he's going to have production week one and he's going to have the snap counts because Tyrell Williams is now on the IR. This is a tweet from Marcus Mosier. So I never heard this until now, but Raiders wide receiver Brian Edwards started on his varsity football team at the age of 13. I don't know what the I was doing at the age of 13, but it was probably something embarrassing that I would not want to throw on air. Brian Edwards is out here making plays for his varsity football team. Did it at age 13, he broke out in the SEC at South Carolina at the age of 17, and now he's about to do it in the NFL at age 21. Throw him in your flex play if you're desperate, but make sure that you pick him up before waivers run next week. One of my sits for this week, this is going to be a tough one to sell, I'm going to be honest. It's just A.J. Brown at Denver. A.J. Brown at Denver, I have him ranked as wide receiver 23. So I still have him ranked as a, as a wide receiver too. And obviously, if he's on your team, you took him in like the third, fourth round. You probably don't have the luxury of sitting him. ECR has him as wide receiver 14. Now, Denver is going to be a brutal, brutal environment to play in right now, right? In week one, to begin with, most players are not necessarily up to football shape. Now, factor in the, the idea that you're getting the shortened summer where you didn't have all summer to get right and get conditioned into NFL shape. Now, triple factor in to the fact that you're in high ass altitude, okay? So all of these things make me feel like I'm not going to want to play a lot of guys in this game, especially not on the traveling team, the Tennessee team, who has not been practicing for this Denver altitude, right? I don't really want to play anyone in this game, but it's going to be a slow paced game, a run heavy game, one that chews up clock and does not score a lot of points, 41 and a half point over under for this one. Tennessee is going to want to want to run the ball 30 times with Derrick Henry. While Brown is a guy who can get it done on limited targets, which is what he basically did like all of 2019. That's why we love him, right? Because he was super efficient. I'm not sure this is the game that I want to bet on that happening. Let's switch gears and move over to the running back position. Real quick before we do though, one of the like key, key, key things to keep an eye on you know, I talked about James Bradbury moving over to the New York Giants. Now, you have to keep an eye on like the low key cornerback moves that happen. Like Darius Slay is in Philly. James Bradbury moves over to the Giants. Chris Harris, formerly of Denver, which I guess makes my A.J. Brown argument a little fucking terrible, to be honest. But Chris Harris moving over to the Chargers, which most of you guys probably don't forget about because he's on hard knocks and whatnot. But these are some of the guys you need to be remembering and paying attention to when we're talking about matchups. And I've talked about player profiler a ton of times, but one of the really cool things that they do throughout the season that is usually behind a paywall, like if you're trying to get wide receiver cornerback matchups, if you try to get it through PFF or, you know, pro football focus, you have to pay for it. But on player profiler site, it is not 
up yet, but they have an unbelievable amount of free tools and free stats and advanced metrics and stuff for you to use. But once the NFL season actually gets going, if you go to playerprofiler.com and you search a player's name, you'll be able to see the actual uh, cornerback matchup that they get, as well as look at previous matchups, how they did against cornerbacks in uh, games that they did over the last like month, over the last year, however many games. So if you go to like AJ Brown's profile, and right there in the middle, right under his picture, you'll see a tab to click game log. You'll see back last year, it has all 16 games listed that he played in last year, as well as the primary cornerback that he played against. So it gives you a much better idea of like the usage that he got. You can see over the first half of the year how he was not getting a lot of snaps, right? His snap share was pretty much below 60 to 65% in the first entirety of the half. That didn't make any sense but over the entirety of the first half of the season and then he starts getting up over the 90 percent mark 100 percent mark over the second half of the season that's when he explodes but this is going to be an extremely 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 useful tool for y'all throughout the season to find out about cornerback matchups versus wide receivers which is usually behind paywalls so this is extremely extremely important for y'all let's talk running bikes ah. first guy up on my list is James White. I have him as RB21. His consensus as ECR is RB28. So Damian Harris is on the IR for the first three games at minimum. Sony Michelle, I think, is going to be limited at the start of the year, as we could see from this report. ESPN's Mike Reese writes the Patriots figure to ease Sony Michelle foot into the mix, like, you know, drink. I think this is one of the games where James White, the familiarity of everything, getting Cam's feet kind of under him, getting him set, a bunch of easy passes to get his confidence flowing. And, you know, he hasn't been on the football field in a long time. I think this is one where, like, White could see 50 to 60% of the snaps. And when White has games where he sees 50 to 60% of the snaps, usually equates to a lot of fantasy points. A very easy matchup against Miami, obviously. And anytime we can get any Patriot running back on the field for that long, I think this is like the week to start James White. And you look back at the last bunch of matchups that he's had against Miami, he scored a touchdown in both matchups against Miami last year, receiving touchdowns in both matchups. He's also had four total touchdowns over the last four games against Miami. So I like New England to come out here and kind of smother them. I like James White to be very involved very early, very often. Big fantasy day for James White coming. Another kind of like low-key scat back that I like. Boston Scott out in Washington. They're playing in Washington against the Skins, who have a very, very fierce front seven, as I mentioned before. I have Boston Scott as my RB34, ECR running back 43. So I'm about nine or 10 spots ahead. Now, here's the thing. Doug Peterson came out and said Sanders is still day-to-day. -day. They might have to limit him in the beginning of the year. Okay, I don't see a lot of success coming from this backfield by way of the ground. I think a lot of their game plan is going to be quick, short dump offs, a lot of screen plays, a lot of, you know, running slants from the slot for these guys, Boston Scott and Miles Sanders. If Sanders is limited at all, this is going to be a big uptick in playing time for a guy like Boston Scott, right? They're going to need these pass catching weapons. As I said, Jalen Rager is out and it lines up for Scott to get a lot more playing time in week one in particular than he probably will throughout the rest of the year. So any sort of PPR format, like don't be afraid to throw Boston Scott in there. On the flip side, on the flip side, again, if you want all my rankings, by the way, again, patreon.com slash BDGE, they will go live every Thursday, way before the Thursday night football games kick off. So patreon.com forward slash BDGE. Antonio Gibson on the flip side, uh, the, He's just not a guy I want to play in week one. He's a guy that I think you almost definitely need to see it in order to feel comfortable with it. ECR has him as RB29, so like a very solid flex play. In my rankings, he's back at like RB34 or 35, I believe. So not a huge dip off, but that usually is that area of the rankings where you go from like viable flex play to probably on the bench. Philly's front seven, again, is stout. They're going to be stout. They've been a very good run defense for the last bunch of years. I think JD McKissick is going to be a lot more involved in the passing game than people realize. I think Antonio Gibson is not going to be a guy that is starting off the year, at least as like the, the ground and pound guy. I'd be very surprised if Antonio Gibson saw, you know, nine to 10 carries in this game. I just need to see Gibson operate as more than like the second fiddle in a running back by committee before I throw him into the lineup. So Gibson will not be a guy that I put into my lineup this year. And then we have this Colts backfield, the Colts backfield, Jonathan Taylor and Marlon Mack at Jacksonville. So without a doubt, we know Jacksonville has one of the worst defenses, if not the worst defense in the NFL. So it seems like a smash spot, except we don't know which of these guys to kind of smash on. Now I had written this portion of it prior to the report that came out yesterday Someone from The Athletic reported that the Colts literally drafted Jonathan Taylor to spell Marlon Mack when he's tired in the middle of the game 
and to keep him fresh for the fourth quarter. Do I believe that? I mean, maybe for like the first month of the season, but that also means I fucking believe it for the first month of the season. So I am hesitant to start Jonathan Taylor even in this matchup. Right now, I have Jonathan Taylor as my running back 30. ECR has him as running back 23. I have Marlon Mack as my running back 25. ECR has him as running back 30. So ECR has Taylor seven spots ahead of Mack. I have Mac five spots ahead of Taylor. If that report yesterday didn't make you reconsider playing Taylor over Mac, there's really nothing else to tell you. I think you are projecting too much into Taylor's talent for this week one. Another guy that I want to see get the carries, right? If you're if you're banking on Taylor in your lineup for this week, I think you're just banking on the fact that you hope he busts off a 50 or 60 yard run, which is definitely possible because the dude's a f-ing animal and he busts off run like that, like Snacks is busting off nuts on a Saturday night when he's sitting there alone. But Taylor... Taylor, 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 Taylor is going to be limited in the workload. He probably won't add much to the receiving game in this one. Game script should dictate that they get a lot of carries and you know they want to run the ball and that is going to be the focus of their offense. I'm just hesitant, all right? I'll just say if Taylor does not play well in week one, do not be surprised from a fantasy perspective, okay? So let's talk about tight ends a little bit. I, you know, I'm not going to go like too deep into the tight ends or the quarterbacks. I don't even, I don't know if I'm even going to throw anything quarterback wise, because I'll probably talk more about them in the waiver wire live stream. We also will be putting out an entire waiver wire article every Tuesday morning for you guys, our favorite, both redraft and dynasty pickups. And that is available via Patreon only. So that is behind patreon.com forward slash BDGE. I will be doing the the live stream though, but I won't get as in depth. So if you want a much more in depth waiver wire article, that's on Patreon, but Eric Ebron at New York. I have him as my tight end 12 this week. So I have him as a tight end one. Right now, he is the tight end 20 per ECR. I have loved everything that we've heard about Eric Ebron coming out of Pittsburgh camp, about how often he's going to be utilized, about the way they're utilizing him as more of like a weapon and not just an inline tight end. And I love even more so that they get to play the New York Giants. In week one, here are a few things that I expect. Deontay Johnson is going to operate as the top outside guy, okay, for Pittsburgh. But... As I mentioned before, really important to understand this stuff and know this stuff. And if you're following me, I'll make sure that I get as much of it out to you guys as I possibly can. The Giants added James Bradbury, okay? Bradbury was basically as close to a shutdown shadow guy as we had in the league last year. If you look at the shadow coverage he had last year, he had a lot of really, really tough tasks. Mike Evans twice, DeAndre Hopkins, Michael Thomas twice, Julio Jones twice. Like none of them really had big games. He allowed one touchdown to Michael Thomas once. The rest of them were held to 64 or fewer yards. He had Michael Thomas at zero yards, two targets, zero receptions in weeks. Like that list is just really, really impressive. I think James Bradbury signing for New York is going to be an under the radar. Amazing, amazing, amazing signing. So I think Deontay Johnson could get locked up or he could travel into the slot and play Juju Smith-Schuster. Either one, that would actually be better, to be honest, because that is where uh, Eric Iran will run a lot of his routes. So if Juju is locked down up the middle, then probably more targets for Eric Iran. But regardless, I think look at a guy like Chase Claypool, who will probably get limited snaps as a rookie starting the year. You look at a guy like James Washington, who I don't think is really anything more than just somewhat of a downfield specialist. So I don't expect either of those to be involved. Seems like there's a lot of target options here, but when you put context behind it, I think Eric Iran's pretty much in for a big week one based on the matchup, based on everything that I pretty much just laid out. So Ebron's a guy that I could also see being like a very popular waiver wire pickup in week one. <sighs> Some tight ends that I'm much lower on than consensus. It's just my 19, 20, 21. So we have Dallas Goddard, tight end, tight end 19, Noah Fant, tight end 20, and Mike Kosicki, tight end 21. As you can see, they were all seven, seven, and five spots lower than ECR. I... I just don't really want to rely on a backup tight end. Like, I, I don't think anyone feels comfortable throwing Dallas Goddard into our starting lineups. Like, Zach Ertz is clearly... Until Zach Ertz leaves, man, we could love Goddard's talent all we want. But until Ertz leaves, like, there's nothing that's going to propel Dallas Goddard into a starting tight end role. Noah Fant, the other one, like, again, playing in Denver week one. Uh, Tennessee is a very, very, very tough defense. They're an underrated defense that's very, very, very good. They're probably on the precipice of being almost elite this year. And they just have, again, a ton of target competition there between Judy, between Corden Sutton, Noah Fant, now the running backs, Melvin Gordon, Philip Lindsay. Uh, I, I could see Noah Fant getting like three targets this game, and I don't want to rely on that. Then you have Mike Kosicki, who I just think is really not good at football. He's got a really tough matchup against New England. So he will not be in my lineup. I think Preston Williams is back. I think Preston Williams is close to 100%. All the reports are saying it. All the cool kids are saying it. And guess what? I want to be cool. So Preston Williams, you're cool with me. You're healthy, which means Mike Kosicki is going to this year. He's going to poop on your teams this year. 
Don't act like I didn't say it here first. That's all I got for y'all today. Let me know how you like this style of video. This is the first time that I'm doing a video like this where it's like rankings, hit start, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Once we get through next week as well, you can kind of let me know how you feel about the content schedule. But that's all I got for you today. We have tomorrow's live stream on tap. I will be going live on YouTube at around noon, 1 p.m. Eastern time. So you could ask me any questions that you have for your lineup for Sunday. But that live stream is only available to Patreons. Patreon.com slash BDGE, where you'll get my weekly rankings as well. The YouTube live stream will be going up on the channel, though, for you to watch free afterwards. But if you want to be in the live stream and actually ask me questions, you got to sign up to be a Patron. I love y'all. I'm out. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Drink some margaritas this weekend. Celebrate week one. Good luck. Let's go. I'm out. Skirt.